appreciate all who are uh, signed on to this uh, Zoom meeting. We're presently in the study of, uh, of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. We'll start there. Before we do, though, let's just have a short word of prayer. Spell. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this study of ours, where we may learn more about those worthies of old who, though they had not the revelation that we have, yet by their, their great faith, they look forward to a, a reward as we should. We pray, Father, that you continue to bless our study and may we grow and develop day by day into more, into a more Christ like being that uh, we may be prepared to serve our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We stopped off about uh, verse 7, but to just kind of go back to the review for a moment, uh, you know, we started off with uh, verse 1, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's not really a definition of faith. It's uh, telling what uh, faith does. Um, there's things we have, as Christians we hope for, uh, particularly salvation. You hope for salvation? Well, faith is a substance of that. It provides a reality to that hope. All right, are the things not seen in both past and future? Well, certainly are. You know, nobody, as I said, nobody was there at creation, the first uh, 12 chapters of Genesis. Nobody was there. Uh, I know you may think I was there, but I wasn't. <laughs> nobody was there. And uh, you know, the future resurrection of all people from the grave. That hasn't happened yet. So we haven't seen it. But faith is the evidence of that. And as we also said, faith is based on proof. It's not, you know, a better uh, felt and told. It's based on proof. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So it has to be from proof. And it starts out with uh, some of those worthies of old. Uh, uh, went through Abel and and get down to verse seven. Uh, get into uh, Noah. It says by faith, Noah being divinely warned. And so there was a divine declaration from God of what was going to happen, but it's things not yet seen. Faith is the substance of things uh, hoped for and the, the uh, evidence of things not seen. So he was warned of things not seen. And you might keep in mind that <clears throat> he preached to the people there for 120 years. So you know, certainly he was warned at the start of his preaching. So you could say, he preached 120 years or was warned 120 years before the flood came. But he moved with godly fear. He had an implicit trust in God. What God said, he trusted it and he acted upon it. He prepared an ark. And we say that uh, those with faith must actually do some work. Faith without works is dead. He prepared an ark. So the building of the ark was not a, uh, an abstraction. It was real. It was faith in action. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world. And his preaching, he may have done that, but it is, uh, the fact is his righteous actions uh, was in stark contrast to his contemporaries because it's only eight people saved by water. It was their failure to obey God in his in the, his preaching and to repent uh, that condemned them. So they, in essence, condemned themselves. And he became the heir of righteousness, which uh, is according to faith. He warned, uh, he was warned of the coming uh, deluge and told to prepare, prepare an ark for the saving of his household. And he might have some interesting questions. You know, did Noah even know what a deluge was? Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Maybe it was explained to him and 
maybe not. Nevertheless, uh, he believed God and did exactly as he was commanded. By his faith and the resulting obedience, he condemned the world. As wicked as were the uh, citizens of Nineveh, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Therefore, by their example, they condemned the people who rejected Jesus. The same uh, was said of the Queen of the South, who came to hear the wisdom of Solomon, but the people would not hear the wisdom from the Son of God. That's uh, found in Matthew 12, chapter verses 41 and 42. Now, what can we learn about Noah's faith? Well, first of all, he was uh, divinely warned. And uh, we can note nine, nine things about uh, Noah. He was a righteous man before the flood warning came. And he believed uh, the warning and had faith in God. He acted upon it. His faith was accompanied by godly fear, that is, a respect for God. His fear and faith brought obedience to God's warning. And his obedience uh, produced action as he began to preach and to build. He did both of them. His building of the ark brought salvation to his household. His active faith condemned the world of its faithlessness. His faith made him an heir of righteousness. Through him, the Spirit of Christ went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. 1 Peter, the third chapter, verses 18 through 20. In verse 8, we read, uh, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And uh, that comes from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, and we'll read that in a moment. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Uh, four things about Abraham from this verse. Abraham received a call from God. By this call, he was required to leave his home and relatives. He was to go to some unknown location to receive a promised inheritance. Without any question on his part, at least none recorded, he obeyed God, packed up, and left for a country of which he knew nothing except that he was promised to him by God. And in verse in Genesis, uh, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through uh, 3, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you. And the interesting thing about this particular passage, he never promised Abraham himself that he would inherit uh, any land there, but that land was going to become a great nation through him. And he never actually owned any land there. Of course, it was a little bit different times. In verse 9, he says, by faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Abraham never had a, a permanent dwelling in, in Canaan, nor did uh, Isaac or Jacob. The land shown him, he never owned. The only thing he owned in the land of Canaan was the cave of Machpelah, you know, he bought that in by that. He was promised a permanent home, no temporal home, no promised land. When his heirs returned to Canaan from Egypt, Egyptian bondage, they had to fight for the land. But Abraham never had it. 
said for in verse 10, for he waited for the city which has the foundation to Builder and maker is God. Now, why did Abraham leave uh, or live in Canaan as in a foreign country? Well, it says here because he was looking for that city whose builder and maker is God, that is the city of the living God. And we'll read that in Hebrews 12, chapter verse 22 later. And keep in mind that we too are or strangers in a foreign country looking for our long home, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 5. In verse 11 of chapter 11, it says, By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had uh, promised. Abraham was about a hundred uh, when Isaac was born and uh, Sarah bore Isaac about age 90. Now, you do remember that uh, when uh, Sarah heard about all this that she kind of laughed and she was questioned about her laughing. So what does it say here by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. Well, she may have laughed, but she still had to conceive by the uh, natural procreative process, which took faith on her part. Therefore, it was by uh, faith in a son, a promise. And it was not Ishmael, the uh, son of Hagar. It was going to be, you know, she gave uh, Hagar to. Abraham, because she couldn't conceive, so she thought the uh, son of promise would be Ishmael, but it's not. So she did have to have faith, and she had to take action uh, uh, to substantiate that faith. In verse uh, 12, uh, therefore, that's a consequence of the faith of Abraham and Sarah, therefore from one man and him being as good as dead, and uh, read in, in Romans 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, they, they waited a, a long time for the fulfillment of the promise. And, and if you recall, and, well, probably not, but in, uh, when we had the minor prophets in back, uh, back at second chapter, verse 3, the second part of that chapter, that uh, verse said, though it, it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. He will not tarry. So whatever God says, it will come at the appointed time. Not our time, but God's time. He said from uh, one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And let's look at that uh, uh, fourth chapter of Romans, the uh, verses 18 through uh, 21. It says there, who contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, in the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced, faith, that what he had been promised, he was also able to perform. And so was Sarah. So in verse uh, 13, he said, uh, there it says, all, these all, it's, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's the ones who received the promise. These all died in faith, and they died as they lived in faith. Not having received the promises, none received the promises. You might look at verse 39 later. Now, the, none received the promises. The promised seed, uh, Genesis 3.15, was yet in the future, only seen by the eye of faith. 
And he goes on to read, but having seen them afar off, that is by the eye of faith, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Abraham saw the Christ by the eye of faith, as Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. In, in John, that's John 8, 56, having seen far off the, the spiritual land of promise, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In verse 14, it says, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. You know, even strangers and pilgrims seek a homeland. That is a permanent dwelling place. And these people are no different. In verse 15, it says, and truly as if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had, would have had opportunity uh, to return. And you can look at it, you know, there's nothing but the, the promise of that spiritual homeland that prevented Abraham from return to Ur of the Chaldea, or even to Haran. He could have returned to either one of those places. Uh, none of these patriarchs consider returning to, to those places. If they were done so, there would have been a rejection of a promised better heavenly country. In verse 16, he says, but now they desire a better, and that's better than Canaan, Haran, or Chaldea. They desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, if these uh, patriarchs had uh, sought, a, sought a country in those parts uh, had regarded their native or ancestral land as their true country, uh, they would have found an excuse to return to one place or the other. But they did not consider Canaan as their country, nor did they return to Chaldea. Uh, therefore, they desired not an earthly country, and one that's temporal, but a heavenly one, the one that is eternal. Since by the eye of faith they had set their sights steadfastly on a heavenly country, that is, heaven itself, God is not ashamed to be called their God, uh, who said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Uh, it's found in a number of different places, Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, and verse 15, and Exodus 4, verse 5. So God prepared a city for those who had no permanent dwelling place on earth, nor did they seek one. Although it may have been a mystery to them how this was to be accomplished, in fact, they never knew, they seemed to have no doubt that when their earthly house was destroyed, they would have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. In verse 17, we'll read there, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, uh, keep in mind, he was tested before this particular example. He was he was tested. He left the uh, earth of the uh, He was tested by, by the long delayed birth of Isaac. Uh, he was tested by the banishment of Ishmael. But here's another test. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Uh, this test was far beyond any previous test. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now recall that Ishmael was Abraham's first son, but he was not the son of promise. Therefore, he was not considered, quote unquote, begotten. Now Joseph and Mary had other children, but Jesus was the son of promise and was therefore 
quote unquote, begotten. In verse 18, it says, of whom he was said, Isaac, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Isaac was the one through whom Jesus was to come, not Ishmael. To be called, you might look at the Second Thessalonians uh, 2, verse 14 and 15, involves testing. Therefore, we are urged to stand fast. Our call and election is made sure through trials, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. In active faith, with or without works, is no faith at all. James 2, 26 and Matthew 7, chapter, verses 21 through 23. In accepting the call, one must accept the trials, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. It is through trials that we endure to the end. James, first chapter, verse 2 and following, and then uh, 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. <clears throat> and continuing on from uh, verse 18, it says that in, season, in, in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. And let's uh, <clears throat> read that uh, passage in Genesis. <clears throat> that's in chapter 17, verses 17 through 21. <clears throat> <clears throat> Then Abraham fell on his faith and face and laughed <clears throat> and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old and shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, no, Sarah is your wife. Sarah, your wife shall become, bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. And with his descendants after him, and as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. <clears throat> he shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac whom Sarah shall bear to you at this uh, set time next year. <clears throat> you might keep in mind that uh, there, on more than one occasion, for sure, the you know, firstborn was the, by the right of primogenitor. Firstborn was to be, receive the, the blessing from the father. But it was not always the case. In this case, it wasn't uh, that way in this case. <clears throat> And uh, you remember Jacob and Esau? It wasn't the case there either. <clears throat> In Genesis, the 21st chapter, verse 12, where God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. <clears throat> So, uh, Isaac was this seed of promise. <clears throat> but yet, uh, Abraham uh, was told to offer Isaac as a burnt offering, Genesis, the 22nd chapter. Uh, the promise that he was going to be the, uh, you know, through his seed, Isaac, the uh, promise was made. So the promise was made before Abraham was told to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. Yet uh, Abraham never questioned God, but went about the task of offering up Isaac. Uh, God said to do it, and that was enough for Abraham. And he still believed the promise of God, and necessarily assuming that God would raise Isaac from the dead, 
but she did in a figurative sense. <clears throat> Abraham saw that his uh, duty was to obey God and let God handle the details of uh, fulfilling the promise through Isaac. By that faith, Abraham became the father of not only a temporal nation, but also a spiritual nation. In verse uh, 20, <clears throat> by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. Isaac blessed uh, Jacob and Esau on the basis of faith. They became the leaders of separate and distinct tribes, but the promise was through Jacob, the younger, not the older. In verse 21, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, that is, uh, Ephraim and uh, Manasseh, and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. <clears throat> by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instruction concerning his bones. Joseph's prosperity and standing in Egypt well, was quite significant, but that did not cause him to doubt the promises of God. His confidence caused him to give instructions to bury his bones in Canaan. And we read that in Genesis, the 50th chapter, verse 24. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So he was looking at that through the eye of faith. He believed God, and he was going to make sure that his bones were buried in that land of promise. <clears throat> Verse 23 says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. <clears throat> Abram and Jochebed trusted the promises of God, and therefore they refused to obey the mandate of the Pharaoh. <clears throat> they, in essence, uh, cast Moses out into the care of God, uh, trusting God would take care of him. And that's uh, from that we get the uh, uh, passage in the 27th chapter of Psalm, verse 10. When my mother, uh, for the father and my mother for, forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. By faith, Moses, when he uh, became of age, and what was that age? It's about 40 years old. And he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. <clears throat> now, the way he refused it was by his actions. You know, all these uh, examples of faith were accompanied by some action. So by his actions, he gave, gave up his claim. <clears throat> In Acts 7, chapter verse 23, we read, and now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Choosing, verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction for the people of God, that, that is the, the Israelites, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So Moses had a, had a choice to make. <clears throat> At the time that uh, uh, he lived uh, as uh, Pharaoh's daughter's son. Uh, at that time, the Egyptians were learned, they were powerful, they were influential, and the Hebrews were the opposite. But uh, looking at it through the eye of faith, Moses knew that the blessings of God promised to his people through the Abrahamic uh, covenant would be sure. And, uh, and outlast the temporal rule of the Egyptians, that it, in other words, it'd be everlasting. Well, how did he know this? How did he uh, learn about his people and the promises of God and, and so forth? 
well. Uh, happy through Jacobet is a mother and also his nurse. nurse. In Exodus, the second chapter, verses eight through nine, we read, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give him, I give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. I bet she did more than that. And she got paid for it. <clears throat> uh, well, he did that rather than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin in verse 26, esteeming the reproach, reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Now, what did Moses know about the Christ and when did he know it? Now, Adam Clark, he was a commentary, commentator from back in the 1800s. Uh, he believed that God had revealed Moses all about the Christ. He had some indication, as we see in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, verses 15 through uh, 19. That is, uh, Moses did. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from the, your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear according to all you desire to the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see his great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command them, him. And it shall be that uh, wh whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will requ uh, require it of him. Well, uh, the, the, you know, at least Moses had some indication about the Christ. Now, he certainly didn't have the same revelation that we have, so we're in a much better position than he was, but. Yet his uh, faith caused him to take these actions. Now, it says esteeming the reproach of uh, Christ. Now, exactly what is the reproach of Christ? <clears throat> well, it, uh, it's the same kind of reproach that Christ himself suffered. Uh, it's the reproach suffered for one's faith in Christ. It's the reproach that fell to Moses as a type of Christ. It can be the reproach that Christ had to bear in his own person and also in the person of every believer in Christ. And which of those is it? Uh, Milligan uh, prefers the one where uh, the reproach that Christ had to bear in his own person. And Burton Kaufman, he has commentary that you can you can find online. He prefers all four of them, all four uh, scenarios. And Adam Clark was of the view that God had disclosed to Moses all about the Christ. Yeah, perhaps that's so, but. Uh, you know, all these uh, worthies of old had, uh, I think, incomplete revelation. They didn't have the same revelation that we have. But whatever this reproach is, uh, it's a contrast being made between the, uh, let's say, the reproach of Christ as opposed to the treasures of Egypt. They're uh, two separate things, and they're being compared here. And to Moses, uh, whatever he knew, uh, the reproach of Christ was preferable to the treasures of Egypt. He looked again by the eye of faith beyond the temporal to the heavenly country, the uh, city whose builder and maker is God. In verse uh, 27, 
By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Well, let's let's look at this a moment. Uh, he fled to Midian. He fled. So did he do so out of a cowardly fear of the wrath of the king? In Exodus, the second chapter, verses 14 and 15, it says, Then he said, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of the Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. So let's examine this uh, this fear for a moment. <clears throat> in uh, verse 23 above, talking about you know, Amram and Jochebed, said they were not afraid of the king's command. But they still hid Moses for three months and then hid him among the reeds by the riverbank. Were they in fear? Both uh, Moses and his parents took prudent action out of a fear of what the king could do. And we should keep in mind that uh, taking uh, mitigating action in the presence of an imminent uh, danger, that's the fear that's spoken of here. It's not a cowardly escape, and we should always keep that in mind when we're faced with the same situation. And so believing the promises of God, they did not fear the king such, they, uh, such that they would disobey God. But they did use all lawful, that's God's law and man's law, they used all lawful means to secure their personal safety. There's nothing wrong in doing that. By the eye of faith, Moses saw him who is invisible, that is, the king eternal, not, not Pharaoh, and that uh, the king eternal would fulfill all his promises. And well, we're past time, so I'm going to stop at uh, verse 28 and we'll take that up uh, next week.